Hey, my name is Jude, and the Obi-Wan Kenobi series... It was alright. I know a lot of people love the show, and that's awesome, but it didn't really resonate with me. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't great either. And I wanted it to be great. Now the showrunner Deborah Chow and the lead writer Joby Harold, they wanted to tell a character-driven story that focused on Obi-Wan, taking place 10 years after Revenge of the Sith and 9 years before A New Hope, in a time period where the Jedi are all but extinct and the Empire has established their rule over the galaxy. Now when that was announced, that got me super excited. A character-focused story set in the world of Star Wars? Sign me up. And Obi-Wan is the perfect character for that kind of tale. He's a very charismatic Jedi who suffered a horrible tragedy in his life. He witnessed the destruction of the Jedi Order, perpetrated by his former student, Anakin Skywalker, who betrayed the Jedi and turned to the dark side. The two of them clashed in an emotional battle, ending with Obi-Wan having to strike down the man he saw as his brother. And for the next several years, Obi-Wan went into hiding. What was he doing during that time? What would his state of mind be? And what kind of journey did he experience that ultimately shaped him into the wise Jedi Knight in A New Hope? All fascinating questions that were actually presented in the first episode. But as the show went on, it wandered from that kind of storytelling and turned into a solid space adventure with nice action sequences. That didn't sit well with me. There were also dramatic moments in the show that could have delved into Obi-Wan's psyche, but Deborah and Joby didn't capitalize on it. For example, in the third episode, Obi-Wan runs into Darth Vader, and in the previous episode, Kenobi finds out that Vader is in fact his former Padawan, Anakin Skywalker. Vader annihilates Obi-Wan and burns him alive. Obi-Wan is saved in the end, but the episode caps off with him physically and emotionally scarred. That was awesome. It was a brilliant motif from Revenge of the Sith, and it left us with intriguing questions. What kind of trauma did Kenobi suffer at the hands of his former student? What is going through his head after seeing what Anakin has become? How is he going to recover from that horrific event? And in the next episode, Obi-Wan puts Vader to the side and then goes off on a rescue mission. What? There are more examples like that in the show. Moments where the audience could have gained a deeper understanding of Obi-Wan's state of mind, only to be thrown to the side for the sake of pretty action. Lame. So in the end, I thought the series was fine, but it didn't really hit the mark for me. So I started taking down notes on what they could have done to make an exciting space adventure while keeping it aligned towards their main goal, a character study about Obi-Wan Kenobi during the darkest stage in his life. And the notes essentially turned into a rewritten version of the show. It's not a complete rewrite, but I did make some big alterations. The biggest one being, this should have been a movie not a series. This story works so much better as a tight-knit two to two and a half hour movie. Also, it's freaking Obi-Wan Kenobi, one of the best Star Wars characters ever. He should have a standalone epic blockbuster movie. Anyway, I rewrote the series as a movie and I would like to share it. I'm gonna split this rewrite into two parts. The first part will cover the first act as well as the first half of the second act. And the last part will cover the latter half of the second act and the final act of the rewrite. Now, I just wanna clarify, I'm not doing this to say that I'm better than Deborah Chow, Joby Harold, the whole creative team behind the Obi-Wan series, or Lucasfilm as a whole when it comes to storytelling. In that department, I am a chimp compared to them. I don't really know anything. My knowledge of writing comes from watching a quick YouTube video on how a movie is structured and reading the first 10 pages of a screenwriting book only to put it down later because I am super duper lazy. But I like writing stories and this was a fun writing experiment that I wanted to share. So without further ado, here is part one of my rewrite of the Obi-Wan series. We begin on Tatooine, and as we pan across its harsh, desert landscape, we come to a makeshift meat factory. Here we are introduced to Obi-Wan Kenobi, who is working during a scorching hot day. He looks disheveled and dejected, a far cry from the vibrant Jedi Knight that he once was. He takes transport back to town once he completes his job. As he leaves town, 
he overhears gossip from the townsfolk. They discuss the growing spread of the Empire's vice grip across the galaxy, and how they wish that the Jedi were still around to save them. Upon hearing this, Obi-Wan closes his eyes in shame. On his way home, Obi-Wan stops by at a viewpoint overlooking a small farmhouse. Using his binoculars, he looks out onto the house, and there he sees Aunt Beru, Uncle Owen, and young Luke Skywalker. The family is safe and sound, going about their daily routine. The sight of the boy brings a little smile to Obi-Wan's face, but it disappears an instant later, a crestfallen expression replacing it. Obi-Wan makes his way home, which turns out to be a small, desolate cave. He sits outside, eating a little homemade meal, pondering on life. We then get the scene between Obi-Wan and the Jawa merchant, just like in the actual series. We get some light-hearted comedic dialogue between the two, highlighting that Obi-Wan still has that sassy wit to him, but it's lacking that jovial punch it once carried. We then cut to Obi-Wan training outside his cave, but there is something off. He's not training with his lightsaber, and there's no drive or passion in his technique. He's just going through the motions. He is forcing himself to train. We then cut to the middle of the night, and Obi-Wan is fast asleep. He is having a nightmare, and he snaps awake once it gets too much. Obi-Wan looks out onto the cave, and his eyes set upon a dark brown chest. Kenobi walks over to the chest and opens it up. It contains two lightsabers, one belonging to Anakin, and the other belonging to him. With a tentative hand, Obi-Wan reaches out for his weapon, and once his fingertips graze the hilt, Kenobi gets bombarded with the most harrowing memories of his fight with Anakin. Obi-Wan dismembering him, Anakin screaming, I hate you, with a visceral rage, and the horrifying visual of his former Padawan burning alive. The vision ends, and Obi-Wan collapses to his knees. He looks up to the ceiling, and with a pleading voice, he says, Master Qui-Gon, where are you? I feel lost. I need help. Please, Master Qui-Gon, help me. Obi-Wan is met with silence. He bows his head as grief and shame cloud his mind. We cut to the next day, and Obi-Wan is preparing to leave for town. He sees that the chest containing his and his Padawan's lightsaber is still open. He snaps it shut, burying those tragic memories in the back of his mind. We cut to the desert town, and Obi-Wan is wrapping up on his errands. As he goes to leave, he sees Uncle Owen, and goes to meet him. Owen! How was everything? How was Luke? Stay away from us, Ben. We don't want anything from you. It's just a simple question, Owen. Oh, it's a lot more than that, and you know it. Let the boy have a normal life. You haven't answered my question yet. Is he okay? You don't care if he's okay. You care if he's ready. We've talked about this before, Owen. When the time comes, he must be trained. Like you trained his father? Obi-Wan's eyes shift to the ground. Guilt runs through his mind at the reminder of his failure with Anakin. Anakin is dead, Ben. And you played a part in that. I won't let you make the same mistake with Luke. I'm only going to say this one last time. Leave us alone, Ben. I mean it. Owen turns and walks away, leaving Obi-Wan alone with his thoughts. Then suddenly, Obi-Wan feels a slight tremor in the Force. He looks around for it, but he can't find anything. He thinks nothing of it, and begins to walk. But then he feels it again. It's much stronger this time, and he feels it approaching closer and closer behind him. Obi-Wan whips around, and standing there is a woman, wearing a cloak with a hooded mask. Who are you? Are you Obi-Wan Kenobi? What? Are you the Jedi Master, Obi-Wan Kenobi? You must be mistaking me for someone else. Yes. You're him. You're Obi-Wan Kenobi. I am not who you think I am. Leave me be. 
You don't have to be afraid of me. Lowering her voice, the woman says, I'm a Jedi too. She opens up her cloak, revealing her Jedi robes and a pair of lightsabers attached to her belt. Obi-Wan's eyes widen at the revelation. That tremor from the Force came from her. With a blunt tone in his voice, Obi-Wan says, What do you want? I've been looking for you. I'm going to fight the Empire, and I need your help. Obi-Wan's mood drops at the mention of the Empire. You must leave. Now. Obi-Wan turns to walk away. The woman stares back at him with a look of shock. What do you mean? Are you not going to help? You want help? Bury your lightsaber in the desert and stay hidden. Live a normal life. The fight is done and we lost. Let it go. Do you really believe that? Obi-Wan ponders on the question, but a moment later he turns and walks away without uttering a word. Then suddenly, Obi-Wan hears someone shout, The Empire is coming! Kenobi turns to the screaming villager, who is pointing up into the sky. Obi-Wan looks up and sees an Imperial starship approaching the town. He covers his face with his hood and goes into hiding. The starship descends onto town. Once it lands, the entry pads open, and out walks the Grand Inquisitor, leader of the Inquisitors, trained in the ways of the Sith. He is flanked by two other Inquisitors, the fifth brother and the fourth sister. The Inquisitors round up the townsfolk into the main square for interrogation. The villagers cower in fear as the Grand Inquisitor treads past them. Except for one, Uncle Owen. The Grand Inquisitor glares at Owen. Do you know who we are? Should I? Hmm. <laughs> Amusing. The Grand Inquisitor steps away from Owen and wanders through the crowd as he begins to talk. We are Inquisitors, and we hunt the Jedi. Well, in actuality, the Jedi hunt themselves. We have reason to believe that there is a Jedi hiding amongst you in this safe little town. Now one might think that it would be difficult to uncover a Jedi in hiding. But that is untrue, for the Jedi cannot help what they are. They are honor-bound to protect those in need. Now let's say there's someone in this village that requires such aid. What is a Jedi to do? Help them? And risk exposure? Or leave well enough alone? Now a smart person would do the latter, but the Jedi code is like an itch. Their compassion will compel them to act, and that compassion will be their downfall. The Grand Inquisitor stops in front of Owen, shooting him another glare. Don't believe me? Well, let me show you. The Grand Inquisitor sticks out his hand and uses the force to bring Owen down to his knees. The Grand Inquisitor looks out onto the town. Reveal yourself, Jedi, and I will let this man live. The townsfolk look on with terror, and not one of them move a single muscle. Obi-Wan observes what's going on from his hiding spot with a look of conflict. The Grand Inquisitor scoffs and turns to Owen. A shame that this happened to you. The fourth sister walks up to Owen. She ignites her red lightsaber and goes to execute him. But just before the blade connects, Obi-Wan makes his decision. He extends his hand and uses the force to stop the saber's motion and save Owen from death. Sensing his presence, the Inquisitors locate Kenobi, and an evil smile curls up on the Grand Inquisitor's lips. Found you. The Grand Inquisitor ignites his double-bladed red lightsaber and hurls it towards Obi-Wan. The Jedi rolls out of its way, the weapon missing its mark by mere centimeters. The Grand Inquisitor force pushes Owen away, and then orders the fifth brother and fourth sister to hunt down Obi-Wan. We get an exciting chase sequence, with Obi-Wan running through town as he's pursued by the Inquisitors. Obi-Wan parkours up to the roof of the town's buildings, and races to the rooftops, leaping from one structure to another. The Inquisitors trail behind him, 
hot in their pursuit, and eventually, they corner him. The Inquisitors ignite their lightsabers as they close in on Obi-Wan. Kenobi has no weapon to defend himself, but despite that, he chooses to hold his ground. We get a fight sequence between Obi-Wan and the Inquisitors. The Inquisitors throw fast and precise strikes at Kenobi, and the Jedi uses his hand-to-hand -hand training to duck, weave, and fend off his enemies. As the fight goes on, the Inquisitors get the better of Kenobi, and they force push him through a wall. With Obi-Wan down, the Inquisitors go in for the kill. But just before they can deliver the final blow, a pair of bright green lightsabers block their attack. The Inquisitors turn, and here it is revealed that the mysterious woman from before has reappeared, wielding her two emerald blades. She mounts an assault on the Inquisitors, fending them off with her own volley of strikes. Kenobi recovers and joins in the fight. Together, he and the mysterious Jedi overcome the Inquisitors and knock them down momentarily. The woman turns to Obi-Wan. She tells him that she has a starship and she can help him escape and lead the Inquisitors away from the townsfolk. But in exchange, he must come with her and leave the planet. Obi-Wan is hesitant as he remembers her desire to fight the Empire. But then he thinks about how close Uncle Owen was to getting killed as well as the grave danger that the townsfolk were in. Despite his insistence on staying hidden, Obi-Wan does not want any more innocent lives taken by the Empire. Not if he can do something about it. He makes up his mind and accepts the woman's offer. The Inquisitors soon get back to their feet, and the heroes make their retreat as the villains give chase. In the end, the heroes arrive at the woman's starship, and they board it just as the Inquisitors turn the corner. The two Jedi manage to escape the Inquisitors, but not before they attach a tracking device onto the hull of their ship as it flies away. The fifth brother contacts his leader. Grand Inquisitor, we have news. The Jedi has escaped with help from one of his own. We have placed a tracking beacon on their ship. They cannot hide from us. Two Jedi. Hmm. Head back to the ship now. We must act with haste. As the heroes sail through space, the mysterious woman pulls down her hooded mask, revealing her face. She then explains who she is to Obi-Wan. Her name is Tala Durith, a Jedi Knight who fought in the Clone Wars just like Obi-Wan, but she never had the chance to meet him. She was also inside the Jedi Temple during the event of Order 66, and she barely managed to escape the invading clone forces. After many years of wandering alone, she met a man named Roken, and she learned that he was secretly building a group of talented individuals called the Freedom Fighters. Their mission? Bring down the Empire and end their oppression. Tala joined the group and began roaming the galaxy to recruit more allies. During her travels, she discovered intel that revealed the location of Obi-Wan Kenobi, and so she made her way to Tatooine to find the man she was looking for. Obi-Wan questions Tala on how she came across such information, but his words are cut off by a huge blaster shot that rocks their ship. The Inquisitors have caught up with the Jedi. The Inquisitors attempt to shoot down our hero's ship. Tala outmaneuvers the incoming fire at the driver's seat, and Obi-Wan fends off the enemy with the ship's mounted gun turret. Throughout the chase, Tala finds that they are heading towards a planet. She recognizes it immediately and comes up with a plan. She directs their ship towards the homeworld, and as they enter the atmosphere, a vast cityscape comes into view. Tala flies towards it, and there, she manages to send the Inquisitors off their trail by maneuvering through the vast array of buildings and incoming traffic. In the end, the Inquisitors lose their target, but during the chase, they manage to get in some clean shots and critically damage the hull of the Jedi ship. Obi-Wan and Tala are forced to land. As they land and exit the aircraft, the duo notice the tracking beacon on their ship. Tala destroys it quickly, cursing under her breath. Kenobi has no idea where they are. Tala informs him that they are on the planet Dayu, a homeworld riddled with both less fortunate citizens and crime-riddled menace. Tala says that she knows someone on Dayu that can help them find a new starship. They cover their identities with their hooded cloaks and quickly make their way through the big metropolis.
As they wander through Dayu, Obi-Wan observes his surroundings. The planet is bustling with restless activity, with its inhabitants working hard at whatever jobs they have to make ends meet. Along the way, the Jedi cross paths with the Doomsayer. The Doomsayer is spouting off claims that the fall of the Republic and the rise of the Empire is just the beginning, and the worst is yet to come. A crowd of people have gathered around the Doomsayer, and they are all buying into his wild predictions. Even Kenobi starts to believe in the Doomsayer, his mental fortitude crushed by his own shame and guilt. Tala, on the other hand, doesn't believe the Doomsayer for a second. She interrupts him and cuts an impassionate speech. We are all enshrouded in darkness now, that is the truth. But within this darkness, there is a light at the end. I can assure you all, we will reach this light. And once we do, peace and prosperity will be restored to our lives and to the rest of the galaxy. Everyone is captured by Tala's inspiring words and charisma. They all start booing the Doomsayer, who leaves in frustration. Obi-Wan looks at Tala in amazement and compliments her for what she did. Tala looks at Obi-Wan with a charming smile. Just did what you would have done, Master Kenobi. As they wander through Dayu, Obi-Wan and Tala begin to chat amongst themselves. Kenobi gets a sense of Tala's personality. She is headstrong, calm, and highly intuitive. She is also a very optimistic person, and she firmly believes that the Empire will fall one day. Obi-Wan can't fathom how she can stay so cheerful during such a harrowing time. Eventually, the heroes find Tala's contact, who turns out to be a quirky, sarcastic individual named Haja. As our heroes converse with him, Obi-Wan finds out that Haja was the one who gave Tala knowledge on his whereabouts. How do you know who I am? And how did you know that I was on Tatooine? Huh! <sighs> so many questions that I will not answer. A magician never reveals his secrets, my good man. Tala tries to use her charm to coerce Haja into helping them find the starship, but he is not having it. Oh, that pretty charm of yours may have worked the first time, but not anymore. I know of an unmanned starship around these parts, yes I do, but it's gonna cost you this time. 10,000 credits. 10,000? Are you insane? We don't have that kind of money. Ah, oh, what a shame then. Guess you'll have to find help elsewhere. Are you really going to let your own greed stop you from doing the right thing? Oh please, spare me the high and mighty speech there, Jedi. You people lost the war, don't you forget. So your words mean nothing to me. With the Empire breathing down our necks, the only thing that matters is survival. And as it stands, I need money to survive. Kenobi is hurt by the painful reminder of his failure, but he refuses to back down from Haja. If it's money that you want, then money is what you get. We'll pay you 1,000 credits now, plus 14,000 once you lead us to a starship. 15,000 credits in total? Huh. You're not bluffing me, are you? I promise I'm telling the truth. You're not pulling any of that Jedi mind trickery now, are you? No. Huh. So serious. I do like the sound of 15,000 credits though. You know what? You got yourselves a deal. Haja shakes their hand and begins to lead the duo to a starship. We then cut to the Inquisitors, prowling the rooftops of Dayu, searching for their prey. The fifth brother and fourth sister were growing agitated in their search, but the Grand Inquisitor calms them down. Do not be discouraged. They can run, but the Jedi can never hide from the power of the dark side. Under his guidance, the Inquisitors combine their strength and begin to use a technique called Force Aura. This technique allows the Inquisitors to sense the Force energy of every single living being on Dayu. Sure enough, they pinpoint two distinctively powerful auras navigating the alleyways of Dayu. A wicked smile forms on the Grand Inquisitor's face. We cut back to our heroes, and Haja finds a starship for Obi-Wan and Tala. Obi-Wan and Tala are relieved to see that they have a way off the planet, but that feeling quickly vanishes once they sense darkness approaching. A few seconds later, Obi-Wan and Tala duck, bringing Haja down with them. 
as a red, double-bladed lightsaber spins towards him. The blade misses its target by just a hair's inch. The lightsaber reverts its course like a boomerang, and it's caught by its owner, the Grand Inquisitor, flanked by the fifth brother and fourth sister. Uh, I've grown tiresome of this game of hide-and-seek. I will make sure to give you both a painful death. We will never give in to the Sith. <laughs> the Jedi and Sith have battled for over a thousand generations, and yet the outcome remains the same. The dark side dominates, and the light submits. The Inquisitors begin to march towards our heroes. Tala offers Obi-Wan one of her two lightsabers. He gives it a hesitant look before ultimately accepting it. We then get an exciting lightsaber fight between the five duelists, while Hadra retreats to a hiding spot. In the beginning, Obi-Wan and Tala manage to hold their own, but as the battle rages on, the villains gain the advantage. During the fight, the three-on-two matchup breaks up into two separate battles, with Tala fighting the fifth brother and fourth sister, and Obi-Wan clashing with the Grand Inquisitor. The Grand Inquisitor force pushes Obi-Wan to the floor, and in doing so, Obi-Wan's hooded cloak falls down, revealing his identity. The Grand Inquisitor immediately recognizes him with a disturbing smile. Ah, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I never thought I would get the chance to cross sabers with you. It seems that fate has been kind to me. My master has been searching all over the galaxy for you. He will be very pleased once I present you to him in chains. We cut to Tala fighting the fifth brother and fourth sister. The Jedi Knight is holding her own, but the numbers game, coupled with the ferocity of the Inquisitors, prove too much. The villains knock her out momentarily and rejoin their leader in fighting Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan fights the Inquisitors in a three-on-one assault. Kenobi is doing his best, but the Inquisitors are giving him trouble. The duelists get locked in a four-way clash, and the Grand Inquisitor glares at Obi-Wan with his piercing yellow eyes. You are powerful, Obi-Wan, but I sense doubt in you. You believe you lack the strength to defeat us, and you're right. The Jedi will never be as strong as the Sith, and so it is the destiny of the Light to always fall against the dark. At these words, a fire lights up within Obi-Wan. Drawing power from the Force, Obi-Wan pushes the Inquisitors away, and they are all dumbfounded by the Jedi's newfound power. Obi-Wan brandishes his weapon with a look of determination. I will never fall to the dark side. Obi-Wan brings the jewel back to his favor, clashing with the Inquisitors single-handedly. Pacha watches from his hiding spot with a look of amazement. Soon Tala recovers and rejoins the fight, and together, her and Obi-Wan turn the tides against the Inquisitors. In the end, the heroes prevail, and they defeat the Inquisitors, disarming them of their weapons and knocking them down. Tala goes to end the Grand Inquisitor's life, but just before her blade can connect, the Grand Inquisitor unleashes a smoke grenade, blinding the Jedi's vision. As the smoke clears, Obi-Wan and Tala look around find that the Inquisitors are nowhere to be seen. The Jedi can no longer sense their presence, and they relax. Obi-Wan looks over at Tala. Your skills are incredible. She smiles at the compliment. It was an honor to fight alongside you, Master Kenobi. Haja emerges from his hiding spot, and looks upon the Jedi with elation. You know, hearing the stories of how the Jedi fight are one thing, but seeing it firsthand, it's pretty extraordinary. Haja brings them to the entry pad of the starship. Obi-Wan looks at Haja and goes to discuss their payment. Haja, about our deal. Oh, that? Oh, forget about it. This service was free of charge. What? Why are you doing this? Well, you two saved my life, so I figured I'd owe you one. And also, watching you two fight back there, I guess it restored some hope in me. If there are more people like you two out there, then maybe there's a chance for a better life. For me, and for everyone else. So I'll give you guys a little bit of help on your mission, by getting you out of here. No payment required. Obi-Wan smiles. You're a good man, Haja. 
<sighs> of course I am. I'm helping you guys for free. Now, where are you two going? We're going to Jabim. We have friends there. Interesting piece of intel that I will keep to myself. I will not breathe a word about this to anyone. That I promise you. Obi-Wan and Tala take his word, sensing no act of malice or deception behind it. The heroes board the ship and they leave the planet. Aja waves goodbye as the ship sails away. We then cut to Haja navigating the alleyways of Dayu as he heads back to his hideout. And then suddenly, the Inquisitors reappear and trap him in a dead end. Where are the Jedi? Haja doesn't say a word, and he spits in the Grand Inquisitor's face. <sighs> I should have expected this from a wretch like you, but no matter. There are other ways to get what I want. The Grand Inquisitor hovers his hand over Haja's head, and using the Force, he begins to torture Haja's mind, ripping it apart to find the location of the Jedi. Haja can feel his mind being torn apart. He tries to fight it, but the pain is too much, and soon, his screams of torment and pain fill the air. The agony grows worse and worse and worse. Eventually, Haja can no longer take it. The Grand Inquisitor lets go of his hold, and Haja falls, dying before his body hits the ground. I know where you are now, Jedi. We then cut to the inside of the Inquisitor's ship. The Grand Inquisitor activates the ship's hollow communicator. It displays a giant hologram before him and the rest of the Inquisitors, and they all immediately get down on one knee. With an obedient voice, the Grand Inquisitor utters, My Lord. Here it is revealed that the hologram is displaying the image of his master, Darth Vader. Grand Inquisitor, you bring news of the Jedi? Yes, my lord. They are on the run, but we are in pursuit. We have also discovered one of their identities. Obi-Wan Kenobi. The name immediately grabs Vader's attention. Do you know where he's heading? Yes, my lord. We have their location. Vader releases an eerie, mechanical breath. Send me the coordinates. I will meet you there. And that is part one of my rewrite of the Obi-Wan series. Thank you for watching, and if you have any thoughts, feel free to lay them down in the uh, comment section below. Stay tuned for part two. Until then, see ya!